Welcome to Tools for the Times with Wendy Cohen, where you will learn how to be spiritually secure and inspired as you prepare for the future. We are so glad that you're joining us today. Um, Wendy Cohen is a special friend, author, musician. Her talents go on and on. I'm telling if you are looking to be encouraged and um, you need maybe some joy in your life, you're you're wondering where that joy has gone. Wendy is the one to sit with during this session because we're going to be knowing and learning more about Wendy and her love of God and Jesus. And Wendy, come on in. I'm glad that you're here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> you know, it has been such a delight since I met you because you have such an enthusiasm for the Lord and you bring him into everything you do, at least that I have seen. And I, I think that's key in life. If we are going to live a good life, a good life in the Lord, if we're going to live a good life any which way, when we put God at the center of everything we do, when we put his presence right smack in the middle of everything we're doing, then he inspires every moment to be filled with who he is. If we put him on the side, you know, which we often do, now I'm grocery shopping, yeah. Okay, so now I'm grocery shopping, so I'm focused on, I want that vegetable, I want that fruit, I want that kind of meat, and oh, that person's in my way, I'll wait till they move, okay, I want that. And or maybe not wait till they move, Or maybe right? not wait, and then we're at the <laughs> checkout line, and yeah. there's 10 people in front of us, and oh my gosh, we have to go pick up the children. And right. it's like, we have lost first love, and we've lost the center of our lives, we've lost what gives us joy, we've lost what gives us peace, and we've walked into the mundane. And when you walk into the mundane, your life is boring or it's irritating. And when you stay in that place where God is right smack in the center of your life and you're living every moment out of that, there isn't a moment that isn't full of his grace and celebration. And there isn't a moment that isn't an adventure. Somebody's in front of you and they need something from you. Somebody is walking by you and you have something to say to them. It, it doesn't stop. It's Wendy, like, this, this, but this is why you decided to do these shows because we, God truly is the center of your life. It, he is the most important thing in your life. And while a lot of us will say that, we don't live it out. You know, we live in a time when the enemy is using every single tool and tactic he can to turn our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits away from God and away from each other. And he's being rabidly successful. Yeah. The enemy is extraordinarily effective right now in what he's doing. And people try to defeat the enemy on the enemy's terms. I'm gonna fight for this. I'm gonna go for this. I'm gonna struggle for this. I'm not gonna care about these people. I'm gonna, you can see. Mm -hmm. It's like you have created an atmosphere where God's love can't move. You have disenfranchised yourself as soon as you do that making a real difference. You can win a military battle, but you can't defeat the enemy that way. But when you come from God's love, when you come from that place where his truth is empowering everything in your life, and you live from that place, the enemy has no power around you. And wherever the enemy is in somebody else, if you continue to come from that place of God's love, the enemy must stand down. He has no choice. It's, I, where, it's, it's, where, it's where the cracks are in us, where we don't know how to live from God's purpose, and we don't know how to live from God's love. That's where the enemy gets into our lives. I see it in myself every day, because I fall off of that every day, 10, 20, 30, 40 times. I don't know. It happens continuously. And then you have to pull yourself back and go, what did I just do that broke that, that, and that? And how do I reintegrate? And then you start again. I think people probably look at you and go, well, yeah, but you were, you've probably been a Christian your whole life. You were raised you know, in the Bible and going to church and everything. I had it tough. I didn't, I wasn't a Christian until I was, you know, my early twenties. Is that your story? Like, why don't you share what your relationship is with the Lord? 
<laughs> Wait. Well, I will say this. Before I tell the story, I will only say thank God that the Lord introduced himself to me from my earliest memories. Just wow. thank God. Because I was raised by atheist Jewish parents who had become atheists because of the Holocaust. And so they were in between atheists and agnostics. Either God wasn't real, which was an easier choice for them, or God was real, but God was evil and that he allowed evil. And that was a terrible choice for them. And so- That's what my, you were raised in. That's what I was raised in. But I had this innate belief in God and in Jesus because I couldn't remember a day without their being in my life. And at the age of six, my parents left me with, with a babysitter who belonged to a satanic ritual abuse coven. And I watched little children be tortured to death and derelicts and people they could grab off the street be tortured to death. And my parents didn't know what they were doing when they left me with this person. And mm -hmm. as a six-year-old, all of a sudden, Nazi Germany came right into my face. I was like, oh, this is why my parents became atheists. Oh, this is no longer somebody Facing else's death. story. Sure. This is my sure. story. This yeah. is now my story. And, and God is allowing this. And why? How could a good God allow such evil? I mean, I had heard this question every night at dinner, practically. It was like they couldn't forget the problem. And now it was my problem at the age of six. Because you experienced it, yes. Because I experienced yeah. it. And, and, and somehow... And my story is much more complex wow. than this, but sure. somehow a seed was planted inside of me that it was up to me to make a difference. That God had given us dominion over the earth. He had given us rulership over the earth. And, and he did that. And, and later I learned that's in Genesis. He gave us rulership over the earth. And he didn't take it back when we were kicked out of the garden, which means we're responsible for what happens here. And so this, not in such complex terms, but in simple terms as a six-year-old, I somehow understood I'm supposed to make a difference about this. I, I don't know how, I don't know why it's on my shoulders, but somehow I have to change this. Now, because they had succeeded in breaking down my personality structure significantly in those two weeks, I came out of that time a very different person. And from being somebody who loved people, who was social, who had much of the same joy I have now in life, I became an introvert who didn't know how to talk to anybody and didn't know what to say because my reality wasn't like anybody's around me. You just and had I, the most traumatic experience of, of, of anyone's life. It was absolutely horrible and I couldn't talk about it because they said, if you say something to your parents, we'll kill them. And well, I believed it. I'd seen sure. them kill people. So I wasn't, I, I, they took me to psychiatrists. I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't, I wouldn't move. I just sat still in a chair and wouldn't do anything. And so as I grew and the Lord used the arts to help me heal. And as I grew up and as I matured, step by step by step, he began to put me back together again. And I consistently, whatever level of healing I had, I used that to try to make a difference in the lives of people around me. So I did foster care. I worked with teenagers who were in psychiatric hospitals. I, I did many different things in an attempt to make a difference. And then finally, when my life became completely sold out to Jesus, and there was nothing else in my life but Jesus, and I didn't want anything else, and I didn't care about anything else. When that happened, then it became time for me to write a book about my story, to really show how to help people to heal in a larger sense. And, 
And truly, that's what I'm hoping I'll be able to do in these podcasts, that I'll be able to give tools, but not only tools, I'll be able to give a perspective in the Lord to help people who have become diminished by the demonic. So that's one level, diminished. The other end of the spectrum, who are, excuse the expression, but they're mad as a hatter. They have, <laughs> they have thousands of personalities that are all sure. fighting each other. They don't know what they're going to do from moment to moment. And sure. they haven't a clue how they get back to anything. So sure. from this, this to this, tools and a perspective to help people heal. Hmm. There's something else I'd like to add to this, which yeah. is there is such value in the deliverances that God does where people pray, demonic spirits out, they go, and the, people's, the people are healed. There is such blessing in that. But there's some challenges in that because Jesus says, I, I'm Jewish, so I tend to call him Yeshua, so you, you may hear both. So Yeshua says that when you kick out a demonic spirit, unless you fill that space again with something of God, seven more spirits will come in and it will become much worse. So people go wow. through deliverances and people think, oh, hallelujah, this person is healed, they're saved, yes. And the next thing they know, the person's back where they started from or worse. Right. Right. And so when the Israelites were given the promised land and they were given the opportunity to conquer it, they were only allowed to conquer it step by step a step according to their ability to inhabit that part of the nation right. so the way the lord healed me was step by step by step only as much as i was able to allow him to inhabit with his grace and choose that and so i never backslid I never because filled. you kept filling. You you kept filling. I kept filling. Uh -huh. I kept filling. And what do you fill it with? You fill it with love. You fill it with forgiveness. You fill it with truth. Now people can't necessarily forgive everyone at once. We're supposed to, but it it take it can take time. And so the process that you learn is so important because if you learn the right tools and the right relationship with God, you can keep moving forward. And if it happens all at once, great. And if it happens step by step, great. Or if it's a combination. In my life, it was a combination. So I'm not one of these miracle cases that happened all at once. And I'm not somebody that it just kept going incrementally. It's a mixture. So, so I want to ask you this, when you say that you've got to fill yourself, continually fill yourself, you know, maybe people who are listening or watching are like, you know, what? I'm just not going to sit down and read the Bible in a year. What are some practical steps that you can start filling? I mean, it sounds to me like you fill yourself by loving other people. That's a good, that's a good step that that's realistic for us to do. But what are some other things that we can do? You know, if maybe we're baby Christians or we're just now kind of interested in hearing more about Jesus for the first time. So let's let's take what could be a real life example. Somebody has a friend, somebody they're relating to that likes to talk in a very loud voice. And every time that person talks in a very loud voice, the person, the, the person, that caller Joe, him Joe. Joe wants to run out of the room as fast as he can. Joe wants to get out of there, doesn't want to have anything to do with this person. And if he doesn't get out, he's going to yell at the person or something's okay. going to happen. Right. So Joe has to leave the room when Joe's friend, let's say her name is Alice, starts yelling. Meanwhile, Alice feels that she's unheard by Joe. So she yells more because she wants Joe to listen to her. And Joe keeps running. Okay. Joe maybe goes to the Lord, maybe with help from somebody else, that's easier. What upsets me so much about her volume? And then the memory comes. Oh, I remember my mom would yell at me when she was mad at me before she spanked me. And the only way I could avoid being spanked was to run out of the room until she calmed down. And then I could say I was sorry and I wouldn't get spanked so hard or I wouldn't get spanked and I'd apologize. Okay, now Joe understands what's going on with Alice. The next time he sees Alice, he can say, Alice, listen to what happens to me when you yell. Please don't yell at me anymore. Find another way 
to communicate what you're passionate about. And then Alice remembers that the only way she could be heard in a family of eight children, let's say, mm -hmm. was when she yelled louder than everybody else. Sure. And now you've got these two people and they're looking at each other. So what have they now filled? What have they now filled themselves up with? Mm -hmm. They filled themselves up with truth. Mm -hmm. They filled themselves up with a love of themselves, love of the other person. They filled themselves up with the ability to communicate. Now, wow. if at this point they are believers and they in Jesus and they turn to Jesus and they say, thank you for healing this part of ourselves. Help us to let this go so it's no longer an issue. Thank you for being with us in the process. Then they filled themselves up with Jesus. And now they're wow. ready to go on for the next thing. So that just came out of the top of my mind. That's not really I love that. to me. So I mean it's an example. Honestly, I, and I, I don't want to ever turn any, turn turn anybody off to you know filling themselves with Jesus by saying, well, you can read scripture, you can go to church, you can do but you have I've really never heard anyone say you can fill yourself with positivity and truth. And you're filling yourself with Jesus yeah. when you do that. Self-awareness. Yeah. I mean, what you said was so profound that one positive decision of filling yourself with truth and honesty and humbleness, forgiveness. Exactly. But now then, wow. let's go with where you were going. Let's go there. So let's say then you do a word search in scripture on but I don't know, it could be on love, it could right. be on communication, it could be on fellowship, it could be on friendship, it could be on the proper ways of disciplining children. Anything that's related to that, you do a word search on that and you start to fill yourself with scripture related to that. Mm. What a blessing mm. you've given yourself. So the problem now becomes the entryway into God's heart. It's no longer a problem. It's a point of blessing. Right. Right. And then Huge. you and the other person, you share that change together and that seals your friendship. Wendy, it takes a lot of courage to do different things. I mean, if they're in this pattern, we're going to use the, the, the man and woman. If they're in a pattern of that, that's how they, they communicate. That's their relationship. Something has to change to make one say, I, this is, I'm done. I'm done doing it this way. Let's try something else. Yeah. So what you're saying is right now you have the choice. You can make the decision to say, I'm going to stop doing things the way I've been doing them. And I choose to fill myself with positive truth, health, healthy things. And I'd like to share that maybe with my spouse or with a sibling or with my child. Yes. And then there's another side of that which is also really important, just because you've done that, it may be that the pattern is broken in a moment. God does that, mm -hmm. you know, and I have experienced that many times that a pattern ends and it never shows up again. It may be that's not true. It may be that for Joe, the next time Alice yells at him, he starts to react and he remembers, oh, yeah, that's the pattern. I don't have to react that way. And so it may take 5, 10, 15, 20 more times, who knows how many times, until all of a sudden one day he goes, she's actually not yelling. Right. She's just raising right. her voice and she's being passionate. Wow. And he goes, whatever bothered me about that? And then the healing is complete. Then the forgiveness and the release is complete. Wendy, we got to start wrapping up a little bit. But I want to say, first of all, thank you for being so transparent and raw and real. I would love to hear your snippet, your takeaway from today's show. Oh, my goodness. Um because I'll share None with you, this, if you want, I'll share with you what my takeaway from today's show is. Well, we'll both do it. Okay. None of this works without forgiveness and trust in Jesus and love. None of it works. If you can't forgive the person who originally hurt you, like if Joe can't forgive his mom for treating him that way, there will 
always be a wound. No matter how much better it gets, it'll never get well. When he forgives his mom and releases her and lets her go and breaks all agreement he had with that pattern and trust God to fill it, then it's a complete issue. So forgiveness is at the core of a redemptive life. Jesus forgave us on the cross. We're told to pick up our crosses and carry them. That means we forgive those who have hurt us. We forgive those even if they're killing us. We forgive them if they've broken us to a thousand pieces. We forgive them if they've taken all of our money and we have nothing left. We forgive them so that we come back to wholeness and we come back to relationship with God because it's God's to judge and not ours. And when we honor that fact and we let go, then God has the right to do what he wants to do. And if he can redeem that person and heal that person, that's the best. But that's in his part, not in ours. And we just forgive and we're free and we can go on. So, yeah. Uh, my quick takeaway is we have no excuse. It doesn't matter if you were raised in the church or you were left with a satanic babysitter. God can redeem and it's a choice that we have to make. And as you're talking about forgiveness, I, I can't help but think about your book, Freedom, True Freedom Lasts Forever. Yeah. A powerful, powerful read, Wendy. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was a blessing to write it. And I pray that people who read it discover more of who they are in Jesus, more of who they were created to be, and more of the power they have in this season to make a difference in the world around them and that they are inspired to create beauty and freedom and love in those around them and in their lives. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I was six years old, my parents left me with a babysitter who practiced ritual abuse. It took me a lifetime to gain my sanity back. Wendy Cohen, a Messianic Jew and author of Freedom, True Freedom Lasts Forever, experienced something that no one, especially a child, should ever experience. How does somebody recover from something like that? No matter what harm has come to you, you can be completely freed of all of its effects through your trust in Jesus Christ. How do we get to that place of freedom? When we surrender completely to His love and let Him take over, He removes all the effects of whatever darkness has influenced us. Wendy is available to share her wildly inspiring story and to speak and minister to your church, congregation, and gathering. Empowerment to destroy all the darkness in our lives today. Book Wendy to speak at your next event. Go to her website, wendy-cohen.com.